Hallelujah. This morning, uh, as I was praying and seeking the Lord to see what to share, I know we've been on a series, a series that's entitled uh, 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 Unshackled, Being Free or Freedom from the uh, Pain of Our Past. We've been dealing with some things with that. Uh, talked about unworthiness. We've talked about fear. Uh, in the future, we're going to talk about other things. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about uh, some other issues as well. But today, I really felt like the Lord was leading me to deal with this aspect of Thanksgiving, being that this is uh, the week coming, Thanksgiving week, and, and to remind us of some things, to build us up to strengthen us uh, because the giving of thanks to God is a vital part of our Christian life and needs to be a part of our life every day. Is everybody hearing me here? Amen. And so uh, I have entitled this. I hope you're going to be all right with this. It's not going to be necessarily. I think it's exciting. I think I'm excited about the message. I hope you will be as well. And I'm not going to be moved by your faces because, you know, I know that's always dangerous. Uh, but I entitled this Thanksgiving. Are you full of thanks or complaints? All right. Is everybody good with that so far? How many of you know complaining never accomplishes anything, and yet it is something that people always get caught up in, including me at one time or another, but we need to be reminded that you cannot be a complainer and one who is thankful to God at the same time. Are you hearing me? And so a couple of passages I want us to turn to. First of all, Philippians chapter 4. It's up on the screen, not the, not the actual scripture, but the reference is there. And I know a lot of uh, preachers put all the scriptures on, and I will be putting some on, but we need to be very careful with that. I read years ago uh, a book about church uh, dynamics and growth and things, and one of the things that we found out uh, as he was doing some research, this particular author, George Barna, was the man doing the research. He does the polling for Christian things. He did the research and found out uh, that Many re one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why there's so much biblical illiteracy in the United States, and there is, it's, it's, a, it's an epidemic. I don't know if you realize that. What do we mean by biblical illiteracy? That means that people don't know what the Bible says. A and in the United States, where the Bible is everywhere, accessible, online, as well as on your bookshelf, if you're a Christian, I'm sure, even those that aren't Christians, many of them have a Bible in their house, even if it's just collecting dust or decorating the, the, the coffee table. Are you, hearing, are you hearing me here, all right? Uh, but yet, one of the reasons why uh, they concluded that there's a lot of biblical illiteracy in the United States today is because a lot of preachers and pastors have gone to just putting all the scriptures up on the screen and not having people get their Bibles. And people have ended up not bringing their Bibles with them. I want to encourage you, bring your Bible with you. If you don't bring your Bible, bring your phone with your app, your, the fake Bible and all that kind of thing. I'm just joking, just joking, I'm just joking. Uh, but, but, you know, bring your Bible with you, Amen. This is a Bible church. And I try, I hope that there's enough lighting. I don't want it dark in here. We got to get some more lighting at some point, but I've done everything I can with what we have to make sure you've got enough light because I don't want anybody saying that they don't even make it bright enough in there for you to read. If you need to, bring a light. Bring one of those little Bible lights or bring a flashlight. I don't care what you bring as long as you're able to read the word. Amen? And so Philippians uh, chapter 4 is where we want to start. The reference is there beginning with verse 4. If you're there, say yes. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says this. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Yes. And so this is not said as a suggestion. This is said as an imperative, or it is said as a command to you and me that we are to rejoice. Notice it says what? It says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Verse 6, I alluded to this. I might have even read it last week. I don't recall. We talked about fear. I think I just quoted it to you. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, note the two words, with thanksgiving. Everybody say, with thanksgiving. thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then, here's the result. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, notice that the peace of God it surpasses understanding. It's not conceivable with the mind. It's nothing that we can really figure out, but there's something about rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, he says rejoice. There's something about the gentleness. There's something about uh, the, the giving of thanks and prayer and petition. There's something about those things that causes this peace that passes all understanding to keep guard over our hearts and minds. And so if you want to have peace manifested in your life, you you need to do those things that the scripture just says to do because those are the, are the ingredients in order to have this supernatural, beyond comprehension kind of peace manifested. Is everybody with me today? 
Now, as it goes on, he gives some more detail about this in verse 8. Finally, brother, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Verse 9, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, so be a doer, and the God of peace will be with you. And so again, he emphasizes and brings out this idea of peace. But notice now, it says this, it qualifies all those things. Some people might say, well, you know what? What I'm going through is true. What I'm going through, you know, the situation, the trial, the the pain or whatever, it is true. And he says to think on whatever things are true. However, he also uh, qualifies it by saying that if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, if it's true and it's virtuous and praiseworthy, think on those things. Now, I'm not saying that you deny of the situation, but what I'm saying is what are you dwelling on the most? If you dwell on the truth of God's word, which is virtuous and praiseworthy, if you dwell on that, you get your mind renewed and begin to operate in the peace of God, and many times that's going to solve whatever else is true that is contrary to the word of God. Are you hearing me here today? How many of you know there is a truth of God's word that transcends the truth of yours and my situation? Amen? The truth of God's word, the truth of God's promises transcends the truth of your situation. When you have a situation, you have a trial, you have sickness, you have poverty, whatever the case may be, we're not denying that. Faith is not denying that those things exist. But faith is simply saying, even though they exist, I know a higher truth. I know a truth of God's word that is able to supersede and overcome and wipe out that other truth because his truth is more powerful. Isn't that right? Amen? The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen? Is everybody doing all right today? I'm starting to warm up here. I got to take off this coat. Is that all right? All right. And so let's, uh, let's go on with this now. He tells us what to meditate on, what to think about. He says with all of this, though, all of these things, we're to have thanksgiving. We're to give God thanks. Now turn with me to the next passage, if you don't mind. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Do you love your Bible today? Amen. I do too. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. Notice what it says. Again, Paul, by the Spirit of God, in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says this, Rejoice always. There it is again. Somebody said, well, how can I rejoice always? Well, you know, I know that you cannot rejoice verbally always in terms of, you know, sometimes you're breathing, sometimes you're eating, sometimes you're uh, sleeping, right? How do you rejoice always? Well, again, take this in understanding true living and what have you. He said, really, uh, not only do we rejoice verbally, but the understood idea would be that we rejoice uh, even when we're not able to verbally. Isn't that right? We've got a rejoicing heart. Real worship comes from the heart. You can verbalize all sorts of things, but if it's not from the heart, it's not true worship anyway, right? Are you alive today? I mean, just, you know, stir yourselves up a little bit. Give the preacher a little bit of help. Respond. There, there, is, a, there is an interactive part of the service. I just want you to know that, all right? And so again, everybody say rejoice always. And then he says pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And we can read on and see a lot of other things with this, but notice he says, in everything, give thanks. We're going to touch on that meaning and that a little bit more in just a few moments as well. But in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Now, notice sometimes people say, well, you know, I just want to know the will of God for my life. I just want to know what God's will is for my life. And, you know, there are some scriptures in the New Testament. Uh, I think it's chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians that say this. This is the will of God, even your sanctification or your holiness. And there are certain scriptures that talk about what is specifically the will of God. And people often say, well, I just want to know what the will of God is for my life. I'd submit to you that when you begin to do what the general will of God is revealed in his word, that will open you up to receive more specific will of God pertaining to you and your individual life. Are you following what I'm saying? Because I know that, you know, as far as our individual, uh, the individual will that God has for our lives, you know, is not spelled out in the scriptures. That would be impossible because God has a uniqueness uh, for our lives. He's got a calling on our lives to whatever that might be. And so that's not specifically in there. Nobody said, you know, there's not a scripture in the Bible that tells me, Jay Stillinger, that you're supposed to pastor and, and that kind of thing, obviously. But I do know that if you and I will do what the scripture says is his will generally for all believers, that that gives us the ability to receive understanding of his will specifically in our lives, right? 
And so that's why I've told people over the years, you know, well, start doing what you know to do. Start fulfilling the will of God that's revealed in His Word. Begin to be a doer of His Word. And as you're a doer of the Word that has been revealed, He'll begin to step by step reveal to you what your specific, or His specific will is for your life as well. Walk in the light that you have and you'll receive more light. Is everybody with me today? See, that was worth the price of admission already, don't you think? All right. How do we define the word thanksgiving? There's a lot of ways to define it, but uh, let's define it in a few ways just to get an idea. We've got some things we want to share, and I'm always well-intended. I'm always intending uh, to do a short message. I'm always intending to have lots of time and, you know, and, and be able to pray for people at the end and what have you. I'm always good intended uh, to, to keep it brief, but all of you know that that never happens, and so uh, you're going you're gonna to bear with me here, all right? But notice from the Dictionary Bible themes, the word thanksgiving means the offering of thanks, especially for gifts received. Scripture emphasizes the importance of giving thanks to God for all His gifts and works, both in as, as an expression of our dependence upon Him and gratitude to Him. And so the idea in many definitions of the word thanksgiving, it has to do with giving Him thanks for what He has done. How many of you know He has done an abundance of things for you and me? Amen? And so we're giving Him thanks uh, for what He has done in our lives. And, and in, in saying that, I also want to add this, also giving Him thanks for what He has promised is already done whether or not you've received it or not. Because, you know, for example, in Romans 4, it talks about Abraham, and God gave promise to Abraham uh, that he was going to be the father of many nations. But how many of you know it took about 25 years from God saying that initially to Abraham to it actually fulfilling about 25 years? But the Bible says in Romans 4, referencing Abraham, it says that, that he was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. And, and in being fully persuaded, he gave glory to God. Or he thanked God ahead of time for the answer before he actually saw it manifested in his life. In fact, not only that, but he went around after God changed his name. Uh, when people asked him his name, he said, my name is Abraham, which means what? The father of a multitude or the father of many nations. And so even by faith, he received a change in his name. And in doing so, in essence, he was giving thanks to God that I am the father of many nations, whether it looks like it or not, because God said so. God said so, amen? And so we receive it as such as that. Webster's Dictionary, the real Webster's Dictionary of 1828, read this way of thanksgiving, rendering thanks for good received. The act of rendering thanks or expressing gratitude for favors or mercies. And then going on with this, uh, the most common Greek word translated thanksgiving or thanks, that would be the New Testament, means to freely give gratitude, grateful language to God as an act of worship. And so, you know, there's so many commands for this. And, and uh, we're going to look at some biblical commands. But before we do, I want to share some quotes with you that I think are great quotes concerning Thanksgiving from some authors that I have read after. Is everybody doing all right here this morning? As we do this, I, I want to believe that you're going to be able to have a deeper understanding of Thanksgiving and therefore thank him in a more deep way. Not only on Thursday of this week, but every day. Amen. And so notice now, quotes about giving thanks. There's an author out there. He's been around for many years by the name of Terry Law. And uh, he's a, a Pentecostal charismatic guy, but he's also well-educated at Roberts University. And, and uh, he's got a lot of books, or two, three, four books maybe, on praise and worship, the presence of God. And Terry Law said this in this book, The Power of Praise and Worship. He said, Thanksgiving has a way of getting the wheels of faith moving in our spirit. There's a certain amount of inertia in our faith. Inertia means uh, sluggishness or inactivity. There's a certain amount of inertia in our faith that, is, uh, that has to be overcome. Thanksgiving is action that we can take against that inertia, against that, against that uh, if you will, that sluggishness or that inactivity. It is an action that we can take against that inertia. Uh, to get our faith active. When we begin to recount what God has done, it doesn't take very long to get excited about what he is about to do. Do you believe that today? Amen. When we begin to recount, begin to rehearse, begin to remember. In fact, there is a connection between thanksgiving and remembering. And so as we begin to remember what God has done, it gives us faith. It stirs up our faith to see what he's about to do for our life as well. Amen. Is everybody with me here today? Because I want you to know if you've got faith in his word, if you've got faith in his promises, that I want you to know that God is about to do something in your life if you'll stand strong and give him thanks ahead of time. Amen? 
I believe that. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but I believe that. I believe that God is about to do something. I believe he's about to do something in my life. As I'm a thankful person, as I give him thanks, it stirs up my faith because in my thanksgiving, I am remembering and recounting the victories that he has already brought into my life in the past and knowing that he's the same God. It's like last week when we briefly talked about David fighting and coming against Goliath. Remember that one of the things that brought David strength was he remembered... He recounted his previous victories. He recounted the victory of having slayed, slay, slain the lion and the bear. He recounted, he rehearsed those victories and understood that the same God who empowered me, who gave me the opportunity and the challenge of slaying of that lion and that bear, that same God is going to put that, that giant down as well. Amen? Yeah. And so there is a certain amount of, of uh, uh, energizing our faith as we give thanks to God for what he's done in our lives and what he has promised to do, what he's provided for us in the word of God. Even giving him thanks for the fact that you've been washed by the blood. Giving him thanks for the fact that by his stripes you are healed. Giving him thanks for the fact that, uh, that the angel of the Lord is encamped around about those who reverence him. Uh, giving him thanks for his promises. Amen? It stirs up faith in our hearts, which is so important for us to do. But yet on the other side... If we're complaining, if we're grumbling, that'll rob you of your faith. Are you hearing me here today? That'll rob you from believing God. Also, Terry Law said this, Thanksgiving, therefore, is the trigger that prepares us for the miracle working power of God. And in the context of this, when he read it, when he said that, he was in John 6, referring to John 6, where Jesus fed the multitude, the 5,000. And it says that when they brought the boys' lunch to him, it says that he, he gave thanks and broke the bread and began to distribute it. And so in that, in that kind of context, he's saying that Jesus gave thanks to the Father, and in giving thanks, the food began to be multiplied. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so in that setting, he says uh, that Thanksgiving, therefore, is the trigger that prepares us for the miracle working power of God. And I do believe that. There's something about genuine, heartfelt thanksgiving that opens up miraculous things for our lives. And when I say miraculous, I don't mean necessarily, you know, a demonstrative or, you know, something that's so dramatic that, you know, you know, everybody sees it. How many of you know God does miracles in our lives in every way, every day, if we'll allow him to? And it may not be demonstrative. It may not be something that we even necessarily recognize sometimes, but yet it's there nevertheless. Amen? Are, are you following what I'm saying? And so praise God uh, for God's power and God's love that that power is expressed in, really. A.W. Tozier, I love A.W. Tozier. And he said this, Gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of God, and it is one that the poorest of us can make, and be not poorer but richer for having made it. Amen. That's something worth thinking about, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And then finally, Tony Evans, some of you know who he is. He's a Baptist brother, but we'll forgive him for that. Uh, he's got some good things to say sometimes. Now, you know, if I quote from people, that doesn't mean I agree with every single thing they say. You understand that? I can't even get my wife to agree with me on everything, all right? Uh, but you know what? We eat the hay and leave the stick. Sometimes we're not sure, and so we just set it aside. Maybe down the road, we'll find out, you know, they probably were right. I see that now, all right? But notice what Tony Evans says. He's a pastor in Texas. He said, God says to give thanks in everything. That doesn't mean you need to give thanks for everything. You don't need to give thanks for that bad day or for that bad relationship or being passed over at work, financial hardship, whatever it is. You are not to give thanks for the difficulties, but rather in the difficulties. Do you understand the difference? Everybody following that? In everything give thanks, right? And so in the difficulties, that is a very important distinction and one I think we often miss. Giving thanks in everything shows a heart of faith that God is bigger than the difficulties and that he can use them if you approach Approach him with the right heart and spirit for your good and his glory, right? And so in everything we give thanks, in the midst of whatever difficulty, in the midst of financial trouble, in the midst of sickness and disease. I remember years ago, I was on the radio with another pastor, and we were teaching on the radio. We had kind of a discussion on the radio. This is many years ago, before any of you probably knew me. Uh, we were on the radio, and uh, we, uh, we were talking about praise and worship. And after that teaching each time, we would play some worship music from the service, the church service, and, and encourage the people listening to begin to praise and worship God. And I'll tell you, I, I, I remember to this day, this is probably 30 or so, more than 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago, uh, this lady wrote a letter, because how many of you know that was before Internet? 
before email. So she wrote a letter, one of those old-fashioned things. Anybody, you remember those? All right, so, uh, so she wrote a letter, and she said, I want you to know that as I was praising and worshiping God on the radio along with you, uh, this was recorded, by the way. It wasn't live. How many of you know the Holy Ghost will move even if it's recorded? Amen? She said, I want you to know that I had been suffering. I don't remember what sickness it was, but I've been suffering. It was a chronic thing for years. And I want you to know that I've been free ever since. I've been, I was healed as I was worshiping and giving thanks to God. And I want you to know that there is truly something about worship and thanking God that can bring healing into our bodies, amen, and into our minds, into our lives completely, uh, because there's just something about it. And we see that so often, even in the scriptures, and we won't turn there, but in Luke's gospel, it talks about the 10 lepers. You remember the 10 lepers? I think it's Luke chapter 5, but don't quote me, search, and you'll find it. But anyway, the 10 lepers, you know, they were crying out unclean as they were supposed to do legally by the law. And Jesus was coming by. They asked him for mercy. They said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus said to them, he didn't even touch them. There's no indication he touched them. He said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, how many of you know that they weren't supposed to show themselves to the priest until they were healed in their bodies, right? But they stepped out in faith. And it says that they began to go. And it says, as they were going, as they were going at the word of the Lord Jesus, as they were going, they were made whole. Why? Because they stepped out in faith on the word of Jesus to go show themselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were made whole. They were healed of that leprosy, right? And there was only one leper that came back and gave him thanks. Gave him thanks. And there's indication, some people think, and it might be right, that, you know, with leprosy, you know, as I understand it, it eats away some of your, your appendages, your fingers or whatever. I, I don't know for sure. I haven't studied that out. But in any case, the idea that some have is that the one who came back and gave him thanks not only was healed of leprosy, but also had whatever was lost restored. And there is something about, again, the power of giving thanks. Amen. Now, let's just look at some scriptural commands for giving a thanks. Everybody good? Yes. Scriptural commands. There's a bunch of them. I could never give you all of them because they're all over the place, especially in the book of Psalms, right? In the books of Psalms. In Psalm 107, 1 and 2, and then 21 and 22, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Everybody say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. It says to say so. Say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And so again, it's almost in that second part in verses 21 and 22. That's like the second paragraph as it's written here. It's almost like God is saying, oh, if only men would give thanks. Only if they would, if they would give thanks, if they'd offer up that sacrifice of thanksgiving. Sometimes it may feel like a sacrifice. Sometimes it might feel like, uh, you know, I, I don't want to do this. I, I don't feel like doing this. But we're supposed to be people that walk by faith and not by feelings. We're not supposed to be led by feelings. If we will act on the word of God, feelings might follow our doing the word of God. But we don't allow the feelings to run us. We allow God's word to to direct us. Isn't that right? Is everybody with me? And then feelings may follow. There's nothing in and of themselves wrong with feelings, but if those feelings are th those things that we're letting lead us and guide us in life, we're going to be here, there, and everywhere and, and all messed up. Isn't that right? And so we let the Word of God direct. And so it's almost like he's longing for people, men, mankind, to thank him, to give him thanks, uh, and to recognize his wonderful works. And it's not that God has an ego issue. He doesn't have any kind of ego problem. But he does know that if mankind is not worshiping him, he will be worshiping something else that will bring destruction into his life, right? Because we're created to worship. We're created to see worth in our creator. But if we are worshiping an idol, if we're worshiping something else, someone else, uh, then we are going to be drawn away and that will bring destruction in our lives. And he said, oh, if men would only give thanks to me and recognize that I'm their source uh, because God would want to bless them even more. Isn't that right? And so going on with some other thoughts here, Ephesians 5, 3 and 4, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Now notice the second part of this. Does everybody follow me here? Yeah. I'm giving you scriptures now on the screen, but not all of them, as you know. But I wanted to do, do this so that you could, so I could have enough time. I don't have time for you to be flipping through things to find them all. So write them down. This will be online. This will be on the website as well. Notice the second part of this. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, 
nor coarse jesting. How many of you know that's talking about dirty talk? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Which are not fitting, not fitting, not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And so, again, in the second aspect of it, primarily, he's talking about, he's talking about what we're doing with our mouth. What you do with your mouth is important to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What you say with your mouth, what you express with your mouth. You know, some people criticize, well, you know, these people that are always talking about the power of their words. Well, it's not these people talking about the power of words. It's God's word that talks about the power of your words. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not about what some preacher might say. I'm talking about what the Bible says about the power of our words. You read James chapter 3, and it gives the idea that your tongue is like a fire set on course, you know, that sets things on course. In other words, he compares the tongue to the rudder of a ship and to the bit in a horse's mouth, basically say that your tongue is going to determine in many ways the direction that your life goes. And in this passage, he's exhorting us as believers that our tongue, uh, instead of using it for the wrong things, and you know, we live in a day when Christians, they just do whatever they want. They act just like the world. They talk like the world. They do things like the world. There's nothing to separate them. From. I mean, Christians that cuss. I, I, I've counseled people. I couldn't believe it the first time. Now, I, nothing surprises me. I hope. I hope nothing surprises me. <laughs> but but I, I remember them talking and, and counseling, and all of a sudden, they'll swear. And they don't think anything of it. You know why? Because they swear all the time, probably. Now, once in a while, they'll apologize. But that doesn't matter. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Is everybody with me here? Maybe nobody's going to like this message. But nevertheless, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so, you know, they cuss. And, and then nowadays, you know, nowadays, you know, what used to be cussing in my world is no longer cussing in some people's world. And so now the idea is, well, who said that, who said that uh, you know, you're not going to agree with me maybe. But, you know, I think saying P.O.'d is swearing. The way I grew up, that's swearing. That's cussing. Now, why am I on this? I have no idea. Blame the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. In my world, that's always been cussing. But see, I think that there's always this uh, watering things down. Anyway, I got too much to talk about. I can't get off on that. But your tongue matters to God. Yes. What you say matters to God. Yes. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So he says, give thanks because you are an heir of God and a joint heir uh, with Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed. Everybody say word or deed. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Notice what he says here. Whatever you do in word and deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever think about every word you say? Can you say that word in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is that word contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ? Got quiet in this Methodist church, but praise God. Amen. Something to think about. He says, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now going on, Hebrews 13, 15, therefore by him, that's by Jesus in the context, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Now he defines it, that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks. And so he says the fruit of your lips giving thanks is a form of praising God, right? It's a form of praising God. And this again is said as an imperative. It's, it's something that's a command of God's to us that we're to give the fruit of our lips. And that doesn't just mean singing, but it would include singing. It's the fruit of your lips and speaking. Sometimes we shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph, don't we? There's many ways with our lips, with our mouth, that we're giving thanks to God, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm just not, I'm just not a vocal kind of person or I'm not a singer. You, you know what? God says sing anyway. Sing anyway. You might as well get used to it because you're going to be singing throughout eternity. Amen? Yeah. Is everybody with me? Sing anyway. If you need to, just make a joyful noise. It's all right. Just sing, praise God. Sing with all your heart and worship your God. Amen? Amen. The Bible on complaining. You've liked it so far. All right. Notice this came to me, this phrase, so I'm going to give it to you. You can't be thankful if you're complaintful. 
Isn't that right? You can't be thankful if you're complainful. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Turn with me, though, to this passage, if you would. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to be done soon. Philippians chapter 2. Talking about giving thanks. We're talking about are we full of thanks or are we full of complaints, right? And so Philippians chapter 2. You know, and, and you know, my wife, you know, she's had ample opportunity to complain about things. I mean, let me tell you something. She's an amazing person. Because she almost never, I mean, most of you know, she fell back in May. And she broke her hip, femur bone, and what have you, and has had to have two surgeries since then. I mean, major surgeries, right? Putting metal inside her and all that kind of thing. But you know what? She almost never complains about anything. I mean, you know, pe people wonder, you know, does she get down? I'll tell you, I, she almost never gets down. If she gets down, it's gone just like that. I, I mean, it's amazing. She's even, now she's high strung even keel. But she's almost always even keel. It's just a remarkable thing to me. And I thank God for that. Amen? Because I'll tell you, moodiness is nothing pleasant to live with. Isn't that right? Amen. And so Philippians chapter 2, just notice here, beginning with verse 14. Philippians 2 and verse 14, it says this. Paul, again, by the Spirit of God, he says, Do all things without what? Murmuring, complaining, grumbling. It's translated different ways. Grumbling, murmuring, complaining. Do all things without complaining, New King James says, and disputing. Now notice, notice the result of this, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now notice the inference there is this, and I do have it up on the screen, I'll put it up there, uh, but the inference is what? The inference is that if you're going around complaining, disputing, arguing all the time, that you are not being like a child of God and you are not letting your light shine in this crooked world the way it needs to, right? I thought I'd get more amens on that, but nevertheless, notice how it goes on with this. It says, holding fast the word of life. It's a word of life that we hold fast to. The words that we speak, the word that we read, the Bible, the word of God, it brings life. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. The word complaining up on the screen here means to express one's discontent, to complain, to grumble. Obviously, all these things, some, uh, trans, uh, some uh, expositors say that it has the idea of that, that, uh, that underlying kind of grumbling. You know, that kind of behind-the-scenes kind of grumbling. I want to ask you a question. Are you grumbling behind the, the scenes? Are you complaining to that brother over in that corner or whatever? And just complaining and then grumbling and murmuring and everything. I want you to know that God hates complaining. Amen. Now, I, I found this. I, how many of you remember Calvin and, and Hobbes? You remember Calvin and Hobbes? Well, I've got this to show you. I don't know if you can read that. But Calvin's a little boy, about six years old, and Hobbes is his imaginary uh, stuffed tiger. And, and Calvin says this, the boy says this, some people complain all the time. They complain about the least little thing. If something bugs them, they never let go of it. They just go on and on long after anyone else is interested. It's just complain, complain, complain. People, people who uh, gripe all the time really drive me nuts. You'd think they'd change the subject after a while, but they never do. They just keep griping until you start to wonder, what's wrong with this idiot? But they go on complaining and repeating that, what they already said. And then Hobbes says, maybe they're just not aware of their self. They're just not self-aware with his eyes rolling. And then the boy says, but that's another thing that gets on my nerves. So the idea, obviously, is he is doing the very thing that he's complaining about with other people, right? He's the complainer. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Are you getting anything out of this? All right, let's be self-aware then, amen? In other words, let's realize that we might be doing that which we hate uh, about other people that are doing it, all right? And so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I, I'll, I hope you're doing all right. Am I going too long? If you have to go, go ahead. But uh, we'll be done soon. Soon is, is relevant, but uh, no, we will be. We will be. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice beginning with verse 1. Are you there? Yes. No? Somebody said no. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's right after chapter 9. <laughs> so helpful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Obviously, he's talking about Israel. 
They were under the cloud. You remember when they were delivered from Egypt? They were supposed to follow the cloud uh, by day and, and the fire by night. The fire would stop for them to camp, right? And, so, and then it says they, they passed uh, through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all, uh, uh, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same uh, spiritual drink from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse, verse 6, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now notice now the, the, uh, the analogy here, or the prefigurement, if you will, of the church, really. They were called the church in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7. But notice the prefigurement here. It talks about how they followed the cloud. The cloud is a symbol, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and that they were under the cloud and then they were baptized in the sea, so to speak. And so it's a picture of Christianity. Verse 6 says all these things were written for our example that we might learn by them, right? Is everybody hearing me here? And so as he goes on with this, notice what it reads. It says in verse 7, and, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. Now, I'm not going to talk about all these various things here. But do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to, to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Verse 10, nor complain. Everybody say, nor complain. Look at this context. I mean, so far, man, we're looking at idolaters. We're talking about sexual immorality. We're talking about tempting Christ. And now he throws in this complaining part. In our humanity, we think complaining can't be as bad as sexual immorality or idolatry, at least. Isn't that right? You're not enthusiastic about this message at all. But then he throws in this complaining. It's kind of like, you know, if I haven't hit your spot yet, complaining's on the way. You'll get hit with that one, right? And so he says, nor complaining. As it goes on, if I can get my eyes adjusted here. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples. Somebody might say, well, you know, that was Old Testament. And it was Old Testament. And again, I'm not going to say that God's going to kill us for complaining, but I am going to say that God is just as displeased with our complaining as he was with theirs. Yes. I'll tell you, if it wasn't for the grace of God, man, we'd all be dead. But he didn't kill them all. Some repented. How many of you know repentance is a wonderful thing? So it says again, now all these things happened to them as examples that they were, written for, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And then he goes on and says, There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. Amen? And so God is able to get us through whatever temptation is. But this shows us the seriousness of complaining. It mentions several things, as I said, up on the screen. We've got lust. We've got idolatry. You say, is there idolatry today? Sure, there's idolatry today. Uh, people idolize their career. People idolize their, uh, their, their wife, their husband, their sex partner, or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they idolize pornography. All pornography is idolatry because they're worshiping an image, aren't they? Is everybody all right? And so is there idolatry today? There's idolatry, the worship of money, mammon, if you will. Fornication is in that. Sexual immorality, as the New King James says. And then tempting Christ. Tempting Christ basically is, is attempting to make him do out of your actions or words, to make him do that which is contrary to his will. We'll just leave it at that right now. And then number five, murmuring and complaining. Look at some of these places. In Exodus 17, 1 through 7, Israel complained about no water. So what did Moses do by instruction of God? He smote the rock and water came out. In Numbers 20, he did it again. This time he got in trouble and smote it twice. Numbers 14, they complained about giants in the land. They can't enter. Numbers 16, Korah and his group uh, began to complain and say to Moses and Aaron, you put too much upon yourselves that you think you can leave. We're also uh, sanctified and holy before the Lord. And so they complained they were swallowed up by the earth. Numbers 21, Five. Our soul loathes this worthless bread, speaking of the manna. So God provided supernaturally manna falling from heaven right on time every day. And yet they got so they were complaining about a miracle of God that they witnessed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so Israel was a bunch of complainers. And complainers get in trouble every time. You cannot be thankful and complainful. Amen? We have too much to be thankful for, folks. And so give thanks for his goodness and mercy. Give thanks for eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoops. Give thanks 
for victory over death and the grave. Aren't you glad that even though we may die before Christ comes, aren't you glad that we'll be in the presence of God? Aren't you glad that your loved one who knew Christ, that you can have a peace and a joy knowing that they're in the presence of God right now? Not a hope so, but if you know they knew Christ, you know so, right? You know so. Give thanks for victory over death and the grave. Give thanks for the triumph of the gospel. Give thanks for deliverance from sin and Satan. Give thanks or be thankful for the baptism in the Holy Spirit and your spiritual language and be able to pray in other tongues, especially when you don't know how to pray. And we're to give thanks for the food that God provides. He says to pray, give thanks for that food. Aren't you glad you have food on your table? Isn't that right? Do you know there's people in this world that don't have food on their table? There's one guy, I don't remember who it was, but he, he said something to this effect. He, he said, you know, you know I, I used to complain. How did he put that? He used to complain because he didn't have any shoes for his feet before when he was in poverty. But then he realized that there was somebody that he saw who didn't have feet to put those shoes into. And that gave him a whole different perspective. Isn't that right? Amen. And so again, we have a lot to be thankful for. Give thanks because he has given you an inheritance and you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm just going to close with this passage. The worship team can come if you would. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. Is everybody with me here today? Yes. How many of you know we need to be thankful? Yes. Five of you know that. The rest are getting it. Notice what it says. Amplified Bible, verse 1. This is the Amplified. Bless, and then in parentheses it explains this. Affectionately, gratefully praise. Blessing God is gratefully praising Him, giving Him thanks. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is deepest within me, bless His holy name. How many of you know sometimes you need to tell your soul to bless the Lord? Because your soul doesn't want to bless the Lord. Your soul doesn't want to express thanksgiving to God. But you say, the soul, you're going to bless God. You're going to give thanks to God whether you feel like it or not. And maybe that's what he means when he says a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Amen? And so, again, it goes on and says, Bless, affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of all his benefits, who forgives every one of all your iniquities, who heals each one of all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and corrupt who beautifies, dignifies, and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your mouth, your necessity and desire at your personal age and situation with good so that your youth renewed is like the eagle strong overcoming soaring. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, stand with me. Are you full of thanks or are you full of complaints? Are you thankful or complaintful? God's called us and commanded us to be people of thanksgiving unto God. Amen. If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos coming in the future. And thank you so much, and God bless.